him a note. I'm like, any chance I can get that same suite that I didn't use three quarters of? So. Well, you know, my wife and I, we went to Seattle, Seattle for the Viking game. We went out early and we were there on Thanksgiving, I think, because there weren't many people traveling. They gave us the presidential suite, and the view was fantastic. We see everything in Seattle from our window. The view is unbelievable. But we didn't use anything but the bedroom and the bathroom. Yeah. It's like yeah. there were two huge rooms we just walked through. We didn't do anything there. Yeah, the only time I've really taken advantage of a gigantic suite was when I got the presidential suite at the Tampa Waterside, which is now called the Water Street. I can only imagine how many hundreds of thousands of dollars I did to rebrand this hotel by changing the word side to street. But whatever, that's another topic. Um, and uh, that was the one because I think we were there two or three days. I had uh, I had a couple of buddies sleep in one of the bedrooms that came in from Jacksonville. Uh, you know, uh, actually one of them, Drew McCain, the, uh, the, the golfer. Uh, yeah, the Canadian tour this year and his buddy. Um, and then like I had a poker tournament on the big grand dining room table with the broadcasters and Andrew and his buddy. We used the patio outside. So it's like the one time that I've actually taken advantage of a gigantic suite on the road when I've gotten a gigantic suite where I felt like, all right, this was money well spent. Not okay. my money, of course. Enough uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous. Let's go back to Twitter. Justin Wiggins, how much coffee is too much coffee? Another question unrelated. What is a healthy amount of heartbeats per minute? <laughs> I don't know. One day I'm going to learn what's not the most, what's not the healthiest heartbeats in permit. I think coffee's heart. good for you. Yeah. Uh, from from Ralph Wiggum, beat writer question: If you're covering your beat and you notice something happening outside your beat, like a GM meeting a player agent or another GM, da da da, do you tip off a colleague covering that beat or follow up on your own? It's a really good question. I have yeah, an answer a, for that too. Yeah, uh, I can tell. I, two that just popped in my head is uh, when I watched Doug Armstrong hug, hiding at XL Energy Center. Um, I let Jeremy Rutherford know at the time he was at the St. Louis uh, Post-Dispatch that I thought something was up, and they traded for Bo Meester that night. Um, and then another one that I thought of, we were at the Ottawa Weston during the draft a couple years ago, and right in the open, um, Oren Kulis and Len Barry were interviewing Brian Lawton for the GM job, and I let the Tampa writers know, and Brian Lawton became the GM of the, uh, of the Tampa Bay Lightning. It was right in the open in the brec- in the restaurant at breakfast. Uh, hopefully Lawton listens to this podcast and hears this and, and can tell me if I'm misremembering this, but I have never, I've never seen two owners interviewing a GM in front of the media at the draft. I mean, like you're, you know, that the entire, I mean, all media people do is eat. So, you know, at breakfast, we're going to take advantage of the breakfast and right in the middle of it, Brian Lawton's being interviewed for the GM job. It was hilarious. I have so to defend, I did. I did I, let. Uh, I did let the Tampa writers know that. I do have to defend the media. Sometimes we drink as well. It's not. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, and sometimes we get the presidential suite and do nothing in it. Um, yeah. So, and you know, I'm older than you, and I started covering. What? What was your first year covering pro sports? Uh, pro. I mean, it depends if you include running quotes for AP, but that's no, like, I mean, when you're really, 90s. when's your first year as a beat writer? 95, 95. Okay. Now, my a, first year as a beat writer was 80, 89. And back then writer networks were a big deal because yeah. now, nowadays, if somebody sees something, they might just put it on Twitter, you know, yeah. or, or blog it back then everybody was playing for the morning paper and there were no like Insta scoops. Yeah. So so many, you know, when I cover the NFL and when I cover baseball, you had a buddy in every city that you would correspond with. And the, your yep. first instinct when you saw something was to tip off your buddy in that other market. Yep, exactly. And then the other thing is uh, I used to be in a notes exchange, notes pool yep. with 30 other beat writers, one from every market. Yep. And every Thursday or Friday, we'd share the best notes of the week for our team. And that's how we put together our vast notes pools. I even Sunday did this, notes, um, yep. probably, yeah, my my first I did it my entire career down in Florida when I was writing eighty eighty inch Sunday columns. I mean, I ran into somebody the other day. I can't remember who it was. It was somebody big in the league too, and he was telling me like, "Yeah, I used to read your all the all your." God, who was it? Oh, you know who it was. It was Jeff Chickren, Jacob Chickren's dad, he was telling uh-huh. me, you know, I used to love your Sunday notes pool. And a lot of times it was just literally you're just pulling stuff from friends of yours because that was back also when there was really no internet. So you didn't know what was going on in Edmonton or right. Vancouver. So we had these notes exchanges and it even continued my th- first three or four years in Minnesota. And then slowly but surely when newspapers started to shrink and nobody was writing Sunday columns anymore, it got to be like four or five of us. And then it was just lame. And then it just suddenly just died. Well, the other thing is that if somebody has a good note now, they tweet it out. Exactly. You know, back then, yeah. and and you know, listen, I'm I'm not a luddite. I I enjoy modern technology in many ways, but there was a charm 
to either picking up the morning paper or picking up the Sunday paper and having all these notes and kind of getting a present. I mean, would you rather get a Christmas present on Christmas morning or would you rather get like a piece of the puzzle once a week? You know, I mean, there is something about delayed gratification and picking up a Sunday paper and yeah. having 80 inches. And like I used to write those too on baseball yeah. and in football. There was something really cool about Sunday morning, opening the paper and having just all these cool notes that you were unaware of until you read it. Well, how about the back in the day too, when you'd like you'd open the Sunday newspaper and you'd see the stats for all the leagues, right? Because there was no other way. So, like, oh, that's who's leading the league in RBIs. That's who's leading the league in you know completions. It was. I mean, that's how you did it. I used to sit there every Sunday. I would go into. That's how I got my start. I'd go into the Sun Sentinel building. I was like sixteen years old, and I'd sit there on a Sunday and answer calls from high school coaches in the league. And I put together this gigantic one page probably 150 inches of just agate of stats of top performers and put together a high school page that would run then three days later. So on Wednesday, you were doing the stats for every football team or basketball team or baseball team in the county and in the two counties, Brown and Palm Beach County. And you're putting it together and it was still running three days outdated on Wednesday. And that's how people learned about what was going on. It was hilarious. Um, But one other note on, you know, tweeting notes it, it happened to me last night. So I was telling when Garland was scratched for the um, Arizona Coyotes, I was standing with Craig Morgan and Kat Silverman, our two Arizona Coyotes writers for the Athletic, and that's when news came that, that Garland wasn't playing because of an injury. So Morgan tweeted it out, and I said to them, "I'm like, you know, Boudreaux had a really funny quote about Garland this morning. You want me to give it to you?" And and Kat's like, "Yeah, I'll give it to you," uh, or "Yeah, give it to me." And then instead, what I did is I just tweeted the quote and just figured, all right, Kat and Craig will take it off the quote. It was like I didn't even go to the courtesy of emailing it or direct messaging it to him. I just like to me, it was such a funny quote. I just tweeted it before the game for them to take. Yeah, the world has changed. No doubt yeah. about it. Uh, let's uh, thank Tin. Sh- I want to hit a few more Twitter questions. And we're going to let Michael go. Uh, I do want to thank Tin Shed. The next show is December 30th, 7 p.m. Check out TinShedMN.com. If you go there, you will see their menu. You will see recent additions to the menu. You will see deals they have, two-for-ones, buy one, gets one free, happy hours. They have a lot of happy hour deals. And you'll also have coupons. You can go there and, and get coupons, and you'll know just how good a deal you'll get. And they have a million TVs. They have video games, pinball. It's a blast. The place is a great place to hang out if you're a sports fan or if you know a sports fan. Uh, go to, So check out TinShedMN.com for more information. It's very convenient in the Southern Metro. Uh so Twitter and again, questions. Uh, and again, the next live show is December 30th at 7 December 30th at 7 p.m., yes, sir. Uh, from Chris Hammer, there's a story in The Athletic about Dr. Schott. It seems the Bruins have bought in. Aside from Donato, are there any other wild players that work with him? I think Coyle did, um, I believe, uh, back in the day. I, I wrote I wrote something on his shot, Doctor, years ago. So, And uh, but I don't should, know should, the other part of the question is, should players work with a shot, Doctor? You know, all these players uh, have... Uh, multiple uh, coaches on the side that help him with the different skills. It's just the new age of the NHL. I remember when Parisi was sort of one of the first ones in the league working with Adam Oates, and the Wild absolutely flipped out and felt like it was the biggest, you know, egregious, you know, disrespect and ever to the coaching staff. And now every single player has got everybody from personal trainers to skills coaches. I mean, you know, I was talking to a player the other day. It was just shooting the breeze, so I don't want to say the player or who the guy was sending the stuff to. But he told me after every single game, he gets an email from somebody in somebody in hockey with all his shifts breaking it down, um, and and so that's just the world that that these new that these NHL coaches have to deal with. Is uh, you know sometimes uh, y- y- goalies are that way as well. I mean they all have their own guys on the side as well. So uh, you know that's just kind of the way it is now. Yep. I still remember Tory Hunter. He basically didn't trust anybody in the Twins organization other than like his AAA hitting coach, Bill Springman. And he would send videos to like Bobby Bonilla and stuff like that. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, and it's easier to do now. From hey, Justin, it works. Bobby Bonilla is still getting paid from the Mets. So he, he, he's a financial genius. Yeah. Uh, from Justin Caesar wears pants sometimes. Was that nice run just a bizarre world version of the Wilds annual slump, or is this actually sustainable? What's the guy's Twitter name? Justin uh, it's, Caesar. It's very involved. It's uh, Justin Caesar wears pants sometimes is his Twitter handle. And I still read it. <laughs> I don't know what it means. I'm sure that yeah. I'm sure it's the clever. I'm sure it's the clever handle. I just don't know what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
like uh, again, the question was uh, if this was basically a nice saying, run. is this run a mirage or is this team actually playing have a chance? To I don't know. I mean, you know, they've been one of the best teams in the league since early November. Um, and even if you remember that road trip out to California where they went two and two, they played great on it. Um, you know, frankly, they should have won the game in, in San Jose. And I think they would have gone won that game in San Jose had uh, had there not been an absolutely bogus uh, five minute major in Ryan Hartman in that game. Um, so. Um, look, uh, I mean, they're playing well. Uh, when, now, whether or not that makes them a cup contender, when you're going up against teams like Colorado and Vegas, uh, I would say doubtful. I mean, to me, those are still the two classes in the in the Western Conference. But everybody else is right right there with the Wild. I mean, there's a lot of mediocre teams in the uh, mediocre is the wrong word. There's a lot of similar teams in the NHL this year. A lot of te- I mean, look at Nashville. I mean, they are just. They're just been beyond up and down. They're getting really mediocre goaltending. San Jose fired their coach, getting mediocre goaltending. You know, these are teams I think if going into the season, you'd look at the Wild and say, these teams are better than the Wild, and yet the Wild are right there with those teams. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. Arizona, even with Taylor Hall, is a beatable team. Now, the Wild have beaten them three times of their 13 losses. Um you know, the other night in Chicago, the Wilds should have won that game. They were doomed in by still a superstar. I mean, th- that team is Patrick Kane and nobody else right now. Um, and Patrick Kane killed the Wild that night. Um, so, like, you know, look, uh, the game in Vegas the other night, they're shorthanded. Unfortunately, the injuries caused Bruce to completely blow up the lines, uh, lines that I, frankly, still second guess. And, um, and, and they still almost won that game. So, like, look, they're playing well for a while now. Absolutely. Uh, this is a really interesting question, the kind of question I ask a lot. From Cody Kobernick, what's your opinion on toughness or grittiness? There's a wide split between fans. Some fans think, that, think it's mugging people in front of the net or after the whistle. Others think it's blocking shots and battling in the corners. You know, for me, it's the latter. What do you think? Yeah, well, I agree. I mean, last night's the perfect example of a gritty, gritty win. Okay, you have obviously the huge hits by guys like Condon and Felino in the game, but you have Zach Parisi just jumping in front of shots. Now, sometimes it costs them like the one that he blocked of, of Chikorin and it, I mean, just, I mean, just bad luck saws off his stick and then just drops in front of Chikorin again and Chikorin scores. Um, uh, you know, but to me, that's toughness, that's grittiness. It's being able to together as a team play for each other and sacrifice. And we see it every night with this team. And that's the one thing about the wild, whether they frustrate the heck out of you or not, not you can't second guess. They work their butt off every single night, which is pretty impressive for a team that should be sponsored by the AARP. And the other thing that they do is they are willing to throw their puck, their faces in front of any damn. How many times a game do we watch Zach Parisi, Luke Cunning, Ryan Hartman just throw their, their bodies in front of this? Not to mention, obviously, the Spurgeons and the Suiters and the Susies and the Brodines and the Dumbas. Um, you know, this, this team is plays that, that tough way. Now, are they going to you know, what happened with England the other night, the reason why it was so shocking is that we just don't see it anymore. This is not the age of Darian Hatcher and Chris Pronger and Rob Blake and Adam Foote where you can just kill somebody in front of the net. So England did something that we saw back in the day. What made me, what triggered me was the fact that I know that Aristotle is dealing with an issue right now on his neck and his arm. And so that's why he was hurt. He wasn't flopping. And the other thing about the gift that I tweeted, which I w- wish that I... Uh, tweeted a different one is that I only showed one little snippet of the gif where, where, you know, there was a lot going on there for about 20 seconds. And at a minimum, even if you don't think that it was violent cross checks, or even if you're the referee that thinks that potentially Eric Stahl is, is embellishing at a minimum, it's interference. I mean, the wild are pressuring in the offensive zone and can't get their, their top, one of their top goal scorers off the ice planted in the slot face first because he's being cross-checked there by Derek Englund. It should be a penalty. So, um, and to that moron that, that tweeted me, I mean, there was some schmuck that night that, that made me explode that tweeted something here. I'm going to find the tweet. Listen to this idiot. Okay. This is what you've petitioned for Russo. No tough guys, a soft team. If Reeves was on the wild, it wouldn't happen. You can't have it both ways. Now, first of all, what I mean, isn't it? It's a little irrelevant if Reeves was on the wild. I, I, I mean, Reeves isn't on the wild. They've never gotten to him, so I don't even know. So, so, so like, it's totally irrelevant if Reeves is on the wild that this wouldn't happen. And the other thing is, when have I ever petitioned for the wild to not have a soft team? The only thing I've ever said is that this is not the day and age where there are heavyweights anymore in the league, and there aren't unless blue collared 